Welcome to Southern History in the Headlines. I'm your host, Karen Cox, from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I'm going to introduce our speakers in a minute, but uh, I want to say if you're on Twitter, go ahead and live tweet this session um, using hashtags 2019SHA and also hashtag headlines. Just keeping it simple there. Um, let me begin with introductions. Immediately to my right is Vanessa M. Holden. Uh, she's an assistant professor of history and African American and Africana studies at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Holden's current book project, project tentatively titled Surviving Southampton, Gender, Community, Resistance, and Survival During the Sa Southampton Rebellion of 1831 uh, to be published by University of Illinois Press explores the contributions that African-American women and children, free and enslaved, made to the Southampton Rebellion of 1831, also, known, also called Nat Turner's Rebellion. Dr. Holden's work and writing has been published in Slavery and Abolition, a journal of slave and post-slave studies, Perspectives on History, Process, a blog for American history, and the rumpus. She also blogs for Black Perspectives and the Junto uh, group blog on early American history. Paul Ortiz on the far end um, is director of Samuel Proctor Oral History Program and a professor of history at the University of Florida. His newest uh, book, An African American and Latin History of the United States, was named by Bustle as one of the uh, 10 books about race to read instead of asking a person of color to explain things to you. His book, Emancipation Betrayed, the Hidden History of Black Organizing and White Violence in Florida from Reconstruction to the Blood Election of 1920, was awarded the Harry T. and Harriet V. Moore Book Prize from the Florida Historical Society and the Florida Institute of Technology. Uh, Joshua Rothman, next to Paul, is professor of history and chair of the Department of History at the University of Alabama. He is the author of several books, including Flush Times and Fever Dreams, A Story of Capitalism and Slavery in the Age of Jackson, which was awarded the Frank L. and Harriet C. Owsley Award from the Southern Historical Association in 2013. He is director of a co-director of Freedom on the Move, a digital project that aims to uh, collect and make publicly available every runaway slave advertisement that appeared in American newspapers. He is also co-editor of We're History, an online magazine that publishes brief essays, mostly by scholars, for a popular audience. He is currently completing a book on Isaac Franklin, John Armfield, and Rice Ballard, partners in the domestic slave trading company of Franklin and Armfield. And last but not least, Megan Kate Nelson is a writer and historian living in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Her new book, The Three-Cornered War, The Union, The Confederacy, and Native, Native Peoples in the Fight for the West will be published by Scribner in February 2020. The project was the recipient of, the two, of a 2017 NEH Public Scholar Award and a Filson Historical Society Fellowship. Megan is the author of two previous books, Ruin, Nation, Destruction, and the American Civil War, published by Georgia in 2012, and Trembling Earth, A Cultural History of the Okefenokee Swamp at Georgia 2005. She's also written about the Civil War, the U.S. West, and American culture for the New York Times, Washington Post, Smithsonian Magazine, Preservation Magazine, and Civil War Times. Her column on Civil War popular culture, Stereoscope, appears regularly in the Civil War Monitor. Now let me catch my breath after all those introductions. <laughs> As you see, we got a great group here. This is going to be a little free form. Uh, just a basic outline. I think I would, you know, want to talk with uh, our panelists about the current headlines, what we might anticipate as headlines um, for about a half an hour, and then move into a discussion about ways in which historians are, uh, uh, might use Twitter, for example, how they can be um, proactive in their approach to headlines, how to work with journalists, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the you know, end of the first hour, just open it up to questions from the audience. <coughs> so. What I'd like to do, because um, I'm not going to stand here for two hours, I'm going to ask a question, then we'll get rolling on this. But I thought I would want I want to ask the panelists to uh, think about um, history in the headlines, Southern history in the headlines, 
let's say in the last year, although we all agree that it moves so quickly that we can only remember the last uh, maybe week or so, I can tell you just like as an example, I put a, a Google alert, I set up a Google alert for Confederate monuments that in which I get like at least a half a dozen articles a day. Um, uh, in the headlines. So, uh, so what I'd I'd like for you to think about that. You know, what are those uh, the issues that you've you've noticed? I've noticed. You know, the use of the word lynching by, you know, who and um, uh, <laughs> the film Harriet that just came out has is, is, is generated a lot of discussion out there among historians. So, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Whoever wants to go first, if you want to start going down the line, I don't mind. Um, you know, and what you see is going on right now. And, and how historians have responded, and if you think they're doing a good job of it, of responding uh, to these issues. Um, I'll hop in, uh, if, if that's it. cool. Okay. Um, so uh, as far as what's happened, um, I'll just start with uh, something very recent that's happened uh, to me, but also other black women academics in the Twitter sphere. Um, so the release of the movie Harriet was highly anticipated, um, both from uh, those of us who are particularly excited to see Harriet Tubman get a biopic, um, and uh, detractors of the film. Um, there's a fairly aggressive disinformation campaign launched against the movie, uh, one that is now documented in a couple reputable news articles, that there really was a concerted effort to dissuade people using misinformation about the film's contents. Um, and it is, you know, anecdotally, I've seen ways that it's been successful. I've had students say they're going to avoid the film because they heard, um, they heard it's really just a white savior narrative, or they heard, you know, A, B, C, or D happened in the film. Um, and having viewed it, none of those things are included. Um, but I think uh, something that uh, I knew was an issue and I knew was a reality interacting online, um, but had not yet very directly experienced as uh, the proliferation of uh, bots. So these automated accounts that purport to be a person, but are really just an algorithm somewhere, uh, learning to speak to real people. Um, and immediately upon tweeting the hashtag Harriet, someone with very few followers, but who follows <laughs> many, many people and has a very young Twitter account piped up um, with some misinformation immediately. Um, and then other accounts that uh, also had similar profiles uh, popped up to spread more misinformation. And then I watched as some of those comments were retweeted by people who appeared to be real people somewhere. Whether or not they were actually African Americans, as their accounts said they were, is another set of questions. Um, but something that's become really clear to me is that these algorithms are now actually seeking out and targeting academics and black women academics in particular. Um, something I think is fairly obvious with the kind of uh, feminist scholarship word salad that they sometimes spit out in hopes of gaining traction and getting people to comment to teach them how to speak like us and to us. Um, and so I think these concerted attacks um, will become more and more convincingly like real people. Um, and so we as scholars even have to be careful with who we engage with and how because we may be teaching a robot somewhere how to convincingly talk like us. Mm. Um, and that is something that I, I knew existed, but very recently in the last couple of weeks have noticed um, targeting black women specifically. Um, and that is worrisome for a whole bunch of reasons, um, as is the number of people or programs online pretending to be black people or people who know anything about history. I don't know if you all have encountered this on your own timelines. Um, I block and disengage, but I've also watched people engage and I want to say, no, <laughs> you're, you're teaching them. You're teaching them how to, how to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, first let me just say, I'm sorry you're being trolled. Like that's a uh, terrible, <laughs> 
it's a terrible feeling um, to have that happen. And and I actually with Harriet, I haven't seen the film yet. Um, but I retweeted one of Keisha Blaine's tweets mm. um, where she said, hey, and she pointed out something which I think is an interesting component of this discussion of the film, which is that historians were sort of looked to, at least initially when the film kind of came out before this, the, the bot <laughs> sort of emergence, um, to say whether or not the film was historically accurate. And I think the gentleman to my right was featured in one of those... You can't say what Pieces. I said because then I'm going to have nothing to say when you're done. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I will let him. <laughs> Spoiler alert, Josh is going to talk about what he said. But um, so, so Keisha had had a, she just said, you know, like PSA, historians, movies are not documentaries. Like there's a different burden of proof or authenticity for feature films than there is for a documentary. And I was like, yes. Right. So I retweeted this. It's like, yes. And I have never been trolled so hard. Like, I, I mm -hmm. tweet about abortion rights, about, you know, the gun lobby, all of this stuff. And I have never been trolled so hard as for retweeting her in that context for, for an argument that I really didn't think was particularly controversial, um, that, that film is in part fictive, even when, you know, historical um, or based on on real events. And so it quickly became hijacked, kind of the whole idea, which I think is important, where, and this is, I think, where, you know, Karen's question about where Southern historians can really weigh in in interesting ways. I think one of the first ways that we do weigh in is on this issue of historical authenticity. I don't actually think that's the most interesting question, and that's not the, the thing that we can help mm -hmm. with most. Um, but that's where a lot of media starts with us. Um, and so maybe, Josh, you could take it away and tell us about your experience. Sure, yeah. Uh, so, yes, as a, as a white dude, I do not experience the level of trolling nearly that uh, – that women and scholars of color and female scholars of color experience, um, which, but but I do sort of make my way through other people's Twitter feeds, right? Um, and I so I know exactly what you're talking about. And yes, people, you're training the algorithm, basically. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody watches Silicon Valley, but the season premiere of Silicon Valley this year had had a bit where one of the programmers created an AI bot to talk to one of his colleagues who he doesn't want to talk to. And the dude spent all day talking to this thing, thinking it was his this other guy. And it just got better and better and better as time went on, because that's how the algorithm worked. So yeah, I mean that is that is definitely what's going on. Um, but you know, the the thing with Harriet is sort of an interesting way to kind of get into this topic. Um, and what Megan's referring to, there's an article in Slate. Um, about about the film, and it really was coming at it sort of what's real and what's not. Uh, I haven't seen the film. I hadn't seen the film when I was asked the question, um, but this is sort of one of the most, I guess, controversial elements of the film, um, and you've seen it, Vanessa, so you know actually whether this, this is a thing or not, um, but there is, a there is a character in the film who is a slave catcher, who's a black slave catcher, and uh, I got asked the question by the reporter for Slate, were there black slave catchers? And I said, well, probably. Uh, we know that uh, rings of kidnappers used black people to lure other black people in so they could kidnap them. Uh, I know from my own work that slave stealers use other enslaved people or free people to, again, as basically the, they use them as bait, essentially. Um, I said would not at all be surprised. It probably not in the South because any any unfamiliar black person is going to be presumed to be a slave and might would might well end up in jail and sold. But certainly in the border states, it's not at all implausible for such a thing. I was not talking about the movie. I hadn't seen the movie. I didn't even know this character was in the movie. I don't know why she was asking me the question. I was just answering the question. Um, and what I find interesting about it is not the trolling, although I did get a little bit of that. But what's interesting about this, and this maybe kind of broadens out sort of the way Southern history works with current events, whether it's a movie or a, 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 an anniversary of something or um, somebody in the government says something just, I mean, ignorant even by their standards. Um, but the thing about the, the black slave catcher is 
part of it is part of this dis- disinformation campaign about the movie. It's very clear that that's what's going on over and over and over again. It's the same thing being said on Twitter. But what I do find interesting is that there's a there's a, a certain uh, uh, not kind of person exactly, but there's a certain way in which some people approach the past where what they want to know is they're looking not only the, – the, the important question for them is not could a person like this have been a person, but do you have evidence that this specific kind of person existed, right? Over and over I get asked this on, on Twitter – mostly on Twitter, like, do you have a specific example you can give me of a black slave catcher given a gun doing X? And I'm like, I don't even answer the question. And in part because I think, right, it's not, this isn't a documentary. Um, But it's a, there's a a real kind of um, fixation on facticity that I think is is something that historians deal with when we're sort of interacting with the public generally. Um, and I don't really know kind of how you persuade people that that's not the kind of question that we're often really that interested in. Um, but I do think that that is another sort of angle that Harriet helps kick off is that kind of mis- – that, that, that misalignment between what we do and what people think history is. Um, that I think is is sort of a big sort of chunk of these sorts of problems. Mm-hmm. And Bob, I could add, add to that just briefly. It's the same thing around the issue I work on all the time. Um, Confederate monuments. And somebody said, "Can you give me specific evidence mm-hmm. that these mon- that where people said this monument has to do with Jim Crow or white supremacy? Can you give me a specific speech or you know you know and and, and you know we're working in like here's in the, in ideas about context and in and, and which these things emerge. But yeah, I, I, I hear you and that's very similar to what I'm starting to see as well. I think you see it in all kinds of yeah. different yeah. things. And sometimes it's it's sometimes I think it's people who are genuinely interested. They really want to yeah. see that kind of connection that you're talking right. about. And sometimes people it's just they feel like if they can if they can they can catch you somehow. Yeah, yeah. Saying something that you cannot back up with the most specific targeted bit of evidence and they've got you. Then you're lying, yes. right? And that's yes. that I think is more often than not that's the idea is trying to undermine you through sort of a, a demonstration that you can't be as precise and particular in what you're saying. And of course we know like that's not really what historians do a lot, but mm-hmm. it's often used as a kind of gotcha. Mm-hmm. How about you, Paul? Well, I wanted to talk about the um, the mobilization at the University of Florida um, against Richard Spencer because, as you know, Richard Spencer has been back in the news. Um, University of Florida is a particularly soft target and a favorite target of right-wing people. We just had Donald Trump Jr. Uh, came to campus a few weeks ago. We paid him $50,000 to essentially make a campaign speech for his father. Uh, a speech in which he talked about how much he's done for us poor minorities and uh, low minority unemployment rate. That's all due to Donald Trump, uh, President Donald Trump, right? And so my university tends to be uh, almost kind of attracted to these kinds of of figures. Um, But I wanted to talk about what we did as historians and scholars at the University of Florida just the year before last. Um, And I wrote a a piece with my colleague Susan Hageman uh, titled Nazis on Campus, a Union and Community Response. Because, um, unfortunately, we did have Richard Spencer who came to Gainesville, came to the University of Florida. Um, yeah, can you speak, oh, I'm can sorry. You speak more into the mic? People are having trouble here. Okay, so we had Richard Spencer um, just a couple years ago, came to the University of Florida. Our community and university in the state paid over a million dollars um, to for security to protect him. Um, and as if he needed protecting. And But what happened was, was that the entire community, including people at UF, mobilized, including historians, to deal with the fact that this neo-Nazi white supremacist was coming to our community to talk up eugenics, to talk up um, what he called peaceful ethnic cleansing. Uh, note to self, there's no such thing as peaceful ethnic cleansing. That's genocide. 
And so what we did was we got together scholars who do Holocaust history. Some of you have read in uh, I think Newsweek, I think Norm Goda and I, uh, Norm is a leading scholar of the Holocaust. And we did a number of teach-ins in advance of the Richard Spencer visit, where colleagues who do African-American immigration, Holocaust history, got together with students. And it wasn't just that we did the teach-ins, the teach-ins were designed to lead to actions. And so immediately after a teach-in, a group of students would go to the student government, UF student government and say, why are we inviting people like this? You know, and this is why Nazism is not something we should be talking about in a rational discourse. This is something to fight. Um, the neighborhood that I live in is very close to the University of Florida. We are very heavily impacted by the events in Charlottesville. A lot of my neighbors are um, the sons, grandsons, granddaughters of Holocaust victims who lost entire parts of their family to, to the Nazis. And so immediately when the, when the Spencer visit was announced, neighbors came to my house and some of these retired faculty to say, how could you allow this to happen to our communities? Are you going to allow these people to march through our neighborhoods with their torches? And no, we don't see this as a freedom of speech issue, Paul. And so, but the other thing that we're able to do is, in addition to historians kind of stepping up, engaging with students in the teach-ins, is we used our faculty union. And we have found that faculty unionism is really important for us, especially in Florida. I mean, there's a reason why every university in the state of Florida is unionized among faculty. Because for us, tenure has always been a tenuous proposition. Our administrators have been going after tenure for years and years and years. We have discovered as university faculty that without collective bargaining, tenure is very tenuous. And so our contract, um, Article 10, United Faculty of Florida, AFL-CIO contract, um, basically protects our right of academic freedom of speech. So this allows us to engage in, in very public activities that sometimes our administrators do not like. And they did not like when I spoke out against Richard Spencer. And I told the media straight up, I said, if he had tried to do this in my hometown, I said, I'm a third generation military veteran. I grew up with men who had been POWs in Nazi prison and war camps. I said, he wouldn't have even got in a foot in our town. Uh, and uh, some people didn't. They said, Paul, that's not academic. You're, you're, uh, you know, you're implying there's a violent response here to Nazism. And I said, well, you do the math, okay? Um, but, and we were very proud after these mobilizations and teach-ins and teaching about genocide, teaching about ethnic cleansing, because one of the disturbing things we, um, Susan and I, Susan Hageman, who's an English professor and also a, a union activist, we looked at surveys of you know, polling data about Americans' attitudes towards Nazism. And there's a lot of different polls and, and, and you know, of various repute. But one of the things we discovered was that an increasing number of Americans have either forgotten the Holocaust, they don't believe in the Holocaust, uh, approximately 20 to 25 million think Nazism is okay. That's Americans, okay? And so we have responsibility as scholars to, 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 to grapple with that head on. And at the University of Florida, frankly, we have no other choice because our trustees and our administration appear to be attracted to these individuals. Um, and we actually pay them a good amount of money. Like, I think the week after next, you'll read more about UF because the, uh, I think the founder of Turning Point USA, uh, Charlie Kirk, is going to be coming to UF. And he's part of this movement which says that uh, university campuses have become hotbeds of leftist, radicalist, Marxist uh, take over. Conservatives feel uh, 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 afraid to even go to college anymore. And see, this coincides with a neoliberal attack on, on higher education. Our state-funded universities are dying because funding is drying up. And those of you who are involved in lobbying for our higher, higher ed know what I'm talking about. And it's interesting how this attack on higher ed um, by individuals like this kind of coincides with the decline of funding for higher education, the rise of adjunctification among faculty we're grappling with as well. That's also been in the news quite a bit. Thank you, Paul. I want to build off of what uh, you were talking about and um, this idea of um, historian as activist and the ways in which um, we address headlines through our social media accounts. Um, I think particularly on Twitter, for example, 
Um, I don't think um, people realize how active historians are on Twitter, uh, that nothing really slips by us. <laughs> um, and, and when, you know, another scholar's uh, work is being ignored and, and you know, and probably, we're all jumping on it and retweeting each other about, oh yes, there is this book on, on this topic. Or there's a subject, and uh, for example, when, and I'm gonna let Megan take this one on too, is this, you know, when, um, uh, uh, businesses misuse history to advertise products um, and, and things like that. So I, th I, I think that I know for myself um, on some level I see my social media president presence as a little bit of activism and I'm wondering what you all thought about that. Oh, I think definitely. And I think this is something that connects the experience of historians online and then on campuses, right? Like these things happen and these are sites of really galvanizing um, the forces of, of, you know, academia and, and history to try to combat or to address kind of what is happening right there. And what, uh, what Karen is referring to um, is that sometimes as historians, we can um, both react to things and kind of create headlines um, because when was this even? This was a couple months ago, sometime over the summer. Um, I woke up and I saw on my social media feed one of my friends who's an environmental historian in Colorado uh, reposted an ad that Nike um, had launched for their trail running shoe. They were doing this new campaign. And it was, it was one of those throwback ads, like from the 90s, where it had their, in their characteristic font, a sort of phrase at the top and a beautiful picture of someone running in the, you know, Oregon Hills or something. And then a lot of text explaining why you should be out there running by yourself in the wilderness. Um, which is completely unsafe, by the way. Um, but the phrase that they had chosen was the lost cause. And, and then if you read the text, it was all about, it was actually about getting lost, which again, completely unsafe in that sense, um, but also really just historically tone deaf because it was, they kept saying, embrace the lost cause, embrace the lost cause. And so immediately she was like, um, this is Amy Kohout at Colorado College, and she was like, she tweeted it out, and she was like, I'm sorry, have other Twitter historians seen this? And so then many Twitter historians saw it and commented, and we all commented back to Nike Trail Running in all formats and said, what are you thinking? This is insane. Um, and then everything kind of, you know, there was no word from Nike for a couple of hours, and then they pulled the ad. So I thought this was a fascinating moment. It happened so fast that no one reported on it. And so I decided that I would shift from historian to journalist and that I would report on it. And so um, I called up Karen. She was very gracious. She was in an airport and gave me a 20 minute interview um, about the history of the lost cause. Um, and then I contacted um, another Twitter, Twitter historian and friend, um, Natalia Melman Petrozella, who is a historian of fitness culture and the fitness industry. And she talked to me about how Nike has done this many times in the past. Um, they don't seem to be learning from their mistakes and that they, and they really clearly do not have a historian or anyone who can functionally use Google um, in their PR and marketing um, arm. Um, and then I interviewed Amy as well about, you know, her experience sort of seeing this and then spreading it around and, and doing this and had, you know, historical content on the lost cause, on the, you know, misuse and the larger point that, that businesses really need to uh, use historians and use, you know, their knowledge um, to prevent things like this happening again. Um, I pitched it to multiple places and it was rejected for being too narrow. Um, but then We're History accepted it. Um, or, sorry, no. No, we didn't do Made it. by, sorry. Made, made by, by history. history. But I would have run it. I'm sorry, you would have run it. Uh, made by History at the Washington Post took it um, and, and published it. So we actually did make that headline. Um, but still, it wasn't really picked up by anyone, again, because I think we're partially as historians in a way benefiting from this 
insane political time that we're experiencing because every day brings us an opportunity to comment on something. Um, but then we're also hurt by it in some ways because everything is happening so fast. The news cycle is so unstable and crazy that something like this happens, you know, the power of historians to like make a business pull an ad campaign and everyone's just kind of like, ah, okay. All right. Um, but it is one of those things that we do, and it's an interesting example of how all of that work can dovetail, sort of kind of social media work and activism, and then also our um, writing um, and pitching and kind of advocating activism um, in more traditional but still on online um, formats. But, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I just – one thing about that, though, is that I wonder – and this is sort of as much a question as – question and comment, right? I mean, we're at a conference, so somebody's got to do it. Um, my uh, – uh, I'm wondering, though, whether – you know, it happens over and over and over again, right? They don't learn, yeah. like you say. Um, and so I wonder if – I wonder how you – I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't call these things out when they happen. But I feel like it happens like every day. There's – you know, somebody says something just amazingly stupid that a Google search would have taken care of. You know, a business somewhere clearly does not have a black person on an ad campaign that like this – you could have saved yourself how much money and how much trouble – just by having a historian or or anyone with like thinking about these issues involved, and so I'm not saying that it's not worth calling out, but I wonder if if you ever sort of think to yourself, this is ridiculous. Why do we have to keep doing this over and over and over again? And if if you have to keep doing it and no one ever learns, I I just don't know sort of where that that kind of leaves us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I also worry that it gets to a point where it sort of feeds this narrative that academics are just – all they want to do is sort of hector us, right? Why can't they let us have nice things, nice racist things, um, <laughs> right? And I just I, – I, and I, I'm not – again, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's an obligation to do it. But I do wonder sort of as this plays out, not just that it's frustrating or futile, but that it's, it's just – it's absurd, um, and I don't, I don't really know what to do with that. So, like I said, it's a question. What do you think? And a comment. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and increasingly to think about what Josh is saying, there's a, a line of rhetoric and trolling and attack that is about. Actually, I think I, I just saw uh, either a person or robot uh, term this like the tyranny of the blue badges. So yes. on Twitter, when you have uh, enough of a following that it becomes very important that your account be authenticated as your own and not someone posing as you. Um, so it happens a lot to celebrities and occasionally to academics who have enough of a following, you get a little blue checkmark badge next to your Twitter handle. Um, and so it, it's just, it's another way to attack expertise. So on the one hand, we get all these questions about accuracy. Um, and then on the other hand, when we uh, bring the full force of our expertise to the table, uh, including, you know, publications, uh, whether they're op-eds and reputable news sources, or I actually just retweeted a friend and colleague's book, uh, Force and Freedom, Kelly Carter Jackson, who actually wrote a review of the movie, has a whole section in her book about African-Americans right. who were slave catchers. Uh, she actually screenshotted her book. Mm -hmm. um, then the attack comes back, well, this is just you ivory tower intellectual trying to trick um, real, trying to trick real black people out of what the truth actually is. Um, so it's the same anti-intellectual rhetoric deployed again in internet fashion. So on the one hand, we get called to fact check or we jump into fact check when uh, clearly a Google search could have helped a lot of people keep a lot of money. But then on the other hand, uh, that kind of why can't we just have our nice racist things attack then is marshaled at our expertise, which I imagine, Paul, is also part of what was happening in Florida where like how, you know, well, you know, 
all opinions are valid. All viewpoints are valid. Um, you know, so, you know, if some of those opinions just happen to be genocidal fascist opinions, then those are just opinions that are just in a soup of opinions and you should be respecting those opinions. Um, so it's so anti-academic to suggest that there's a violent response to Nazis, um, even though that's a huge part of our national myth, um, uh, that piece, a piece of this is, well, how dare you even, how dare you question us with your expertise and your knowledge? Um, well, and if I could respond to that, yeah, I agree. And I think, um, this is an absurd society that we live in. It's just absurd. We we the U.S. is so messed up in so many ways that it's hard to know sometimes. You know where are we going to engage? And especially scholars that work on the question of U.S. imperialism, American exceptionalism, um, we have been kind of swimming in this ocean for a long time. Um, I think on the, the flip side, though, I want to kind of be a little optimistic because I think at this point in history, probably no, I mean, I've been a historian for more or less about 20 years and we're actually being called upon more and more and more to give our opinions. Um, and uh, Professor Stephen Prince and I, for example, uh, sitting in the front row just last year, we were in a, uh, a, a forum on reconstruction, uh, the Gerald Schaffner lectures. And um, we did that together, and it was interesting how it wasn't just history we were talking about. It wasn't just Reconstruction. It was a struggle to end felony disenfranchisement in Florida because we were in the middle of the Amendment 4 campaign back then. And so um, as historians in Florida especially, but in different parts of the country, a lot of us ended up getting drawn in and, and actually talking about the connections between Reconstruction, anti-black racism, voter suppression, and, and how his, you know, the work we do as historians is very important to inform activism. Um, in terms of the Spencer mobilizations, um, we couldn't really quite control everything happening in Gainesville. I mean, there were people, you know, anti-fascist organizers who, uh, there were self-defense um, uh, groups. There were people who told neo-Nazis very clearly, you're not going to march through our neighborhoods. Uh, you can try but you're not going to, to be able to do that. And I was in a neighborhood where, again, a lot, we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, descendants of Holocaust survive, uh, survivors. And we told the right-wing people, you're not marching through our neighborhoods. And one of the things, one of the good outcomes was almost a week or two later, Richard Spencer announced that he was no longer having fun uh, going from campus to campus. So he was going to stop doing that. And in Gainesville, we like to think that we made it not fun for him. <laughs> and so I'm glad to cut, I'm glad to shut down that kind of debate and dialogue because, again, um, I guess this is where I show my age, but I grew up in a society where, um, you know, Nazism has, you know, and continues to have a real visceral impact on the people around me, my loved ones, my friends, my, my, my colleagues. Um, but again, I want to you know, go back to this point where I think that there are a lot of <laughs> problems in, in, in engagement. But um, we're, I mean, I, I can't even keep up with the amount of media requests that I have um, anymore. And that was not, you know, that hasn't always been the case. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think, yeah, I, I understand what you were saying, Josh, about you know, it's sort of like, where does it end? And are we even making an impact? But I do think we are. And I think that, you know, even in small ways, um, in, in other words, I'm not willing to not speak about the issue of Confederate monuments and white supremacy. I'm not willing to step back from that. Um, I get terrible emails. I get called names, um, you know, and um, so far my life hasn't been threatened, but I don't know that that, won't, that day won't come. Um, but I, I'll continue to speak out because I... As I was telling the group of students at um, the graduate uh, council luncheon yesterday, it's you know they were saying you know are you even having an impact? You know there are, and I say well there are always going to be people on one side that don't agree with what you have to say. There are, they're always going to be there. There are going to be the people who do agree with what you have to say, but it's the people in the middle that I'm trying to reach. The people who are still. Uh, questioning what they think about certain topics, you know, they haven't made up their mind, and I think that's that's where we can um, make a difference. 
I don't know if you think what you think about that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that from what everyone's saying, just in reaction to that, it can it can feel like we're often shouting into the void, you know, that you're just kind of you're you're trying to do these things and you're not sure if people are hearing you. You're not sure. I mean, you have a measurable impact and that, you know, you made Richard Spencer like feel bad, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> And I think that I'm, I don't think that historians could have anticipated even five years ago that we would see the number of Confederate monuments coming down that we've seen, which I think is, you know, partially due to Charleston, but also due to historians going out there and like talking about memorials and what they really mean. And then student activists coming out and, you know, trying to get them removed from campuses. It's sort of this collective effort. And, you know, I'm always sort of in awe of. Um, just the amount of energy that someone like Kevin Cruz has to like continually dunk on Dinesh D'Souza and other people. And, and I, I, you know, I, I could never do that. I couldn't marshal up that much time and energy to spend on that. Um, but I think if you, if you, are either, you know, reacting to something that's happening kind of in your backyard or something that's directly related to your field, um, it's whatever you think is important where you feel like, okay, I need to speak. I don't think we should feel as historians that we need to speak about every single thing and put that burden on ourselves because I think we'll just burn out yeah. and it'll be, and then you'll just, you know, feel terrible. There needs to be a certain amount of kind of self-care in this situation where you're like, I need to back away from the crazy for a while and, and, you know, do my work in other kinds of formats or do my other work that is related and that I love and is, you know, why I got into this game in the first place. Yeah, I think it's really important, um, particularly as scholars thinking about in which ways we're going to engage different forums, whether it's writing an op-ed or blogging or um, how you interface with audiences at your public talks, um, because as somebody who travels and talks a lot about America's most famous slave rebellion, I get a number of out-of-pocket questions um, wherever I go. Um, so whether it's, it's you know, more analog forms that we're all familiar with as a part of the profession, or if it's deciding to wade into these ever-evolving digital landscapes, um, there there's a point... Um, where you have to decide what your own rules of engagement are going to be, um, what your work actually is, and in which, which ways what you do in these forums furthers the work you actually care about. Um, because you can spend your whole life, uh, you know, all of your time shouting with people on Twitter. I mean, there are people who spend their whole day in their mother's basement somewhere tweeting um, nasty things at people. Um, you can you can spend all your time on that. And if that's not actually your work, um, it is okay to set that down. Um, and so I also, I see some grad students in the audience um, and I've, in visits to campuses, I've gotten a lot of questions from people starting out their careers who say, you know, I feel all this pressure um, to be more public because uh, scholars are able to speak to larger and larger publics thanks to digital technology. I, I feel all this pressure to start a podcast and have a Twitter account and, um, you know, start a blog and do this and do that. And, and is it is that what I need to get a job? And is, is this the most competitive way to do things? Um, and my response is always, well, what is actually authentic to who you are and the kind of work you want to do? If you're already thinking in the mode of a podcast and that's authentically you, then Sure, pursue that. But if you're not, don't take time away from your dissertation research to do that if that's not who you are. Um, and so, you know, I'm active on social media, but not as active as other people for whom social media is a place uh, that they enjoy engaging and have really good scholarly exchanges on. Um, and some of that is about, well, who... What public do I see myself accountable to? Um, who do I care about serving um, with the kind of work that I care about? Um, and what what is it worth it for me to lend my expertise uh, without compensation to? Because um, this is the other thing. Um, as a as a an academic, um, as a young woman of color, there are a lot of demands on my time, and so the ways that I decide to spend it particularly pro bono, I have to be pretty savvy about how that's going to work. Um, 
so there are times where, no, you know what, this is better spent as an op-ed or this is better spent um, working on this talk I'm going to give or this is better spent on my article. Um, and I think that for myself to keep myself sta- sane, uh, it's been very important for me to have very clear boundaries with social media Um, because social media can become a never ending cocktail party. And like, there are of course people at the cocktail party who have had too much to drink and are very unruly. Um, and then there are other people at the cocktail party that want to say things like, well, let me pick your brain. And then they're basically getting free historical consulting. So you have to be very savvy, um, about how you engage with these forms and, you know, what communities are you responsible to? Do you care about doing that work for? Um, because if you get called into the trap of doing it for everybody on demand on the spot, uh, that is, that is not serving you very well or the communities you actually care about very well. As, as just an example of, of someone who's kind of had that experience and then pivoted Heather Cox Richardson, who kind of started out tweeting about a bunch of stuff and then put a lot of stuff on Facebook um, now has a newsletter. So she just, she kind of concentrated them all into one thing and it, it's daily. Again, like she's one of these people sort of like Kevin Green, like there's a lot of energy. She has a lot of energy. Um, but she's paying attention to all of this stuff, but she's now found a way to kind of, instead of mm-hmm. dividing all of that and repeating a lot of points for all these different constituencies, she's kind of put it into a format that she controls. And if you want access to it, you give her an email that is valid um, so that you're getting rid of your, so maybe some of your bot contingent, maybe. Um, I'm not super sure about that, but but that I think is an interesting way because you know she's kind of talking about current events, she's talking about what happened and then giving you a little bit of, of historical context for what's going on. And so that's also a possibility is a, a way to continue doing the work, but to do it in a way that is good for you um, as professionally and also kind of emotionally in terms of your daily life. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate your comments about like where you, where you, where you best fit. Where's the best use of your energy? Um, last year I gave a lot of talks um, on, on the monument issue and it, I, I have to say at the end of the year I was really burned out and I found, I found it a little bit soul killing. Like I had to kind of come back out of that and I had to like spend more time you know uh, just taking care of me and I've you know made sure that I've not made those kinds of commitments um, um, this year and uh, yeah I think you're right there's a changing landscape of where of social media it's like where are you going to put you know I I love the idea that Heather's has created this newsletter Um, I want to just shift the conversation just slightly and before we open it up to the audience and one of which is that I want to thinking about um, this idea of historians working with journalists or when journalists aren't really working with you and then they get the, the story messed up um, and then uh, the historian as journalist, um, uh, which you briefly mentioned, um, Megan. But I was just like, you know, I, uh, I wonder what your experiences have been with journalists, I, I would say, because um, they're it's not always us writing the headlines. We like to be able to do that, but we're usually relying on other people. And so they're contacting us for our expertise and sometimes they get it right, sometimes not right. But I'm just curious about your experience with journalists. Well, I've had generally good experiences, but that's because I was trained by two of the best historians in terms of working with journalists. One. Uh, My undergraduate advisor, Stephanie Kuntz, who I still think is the best historian in this country, and then also Professor Dana Frank, who retired from UC Santa Cruz a couple years ago. And if you, I mean, both of them actually would do workshops with scholars on how to engage and talk to journalists. And Stephanie Kuntz was always very clear in these workshops. and, And I was, you know, I would see her do these workshops with scholars in different parts of the country. And one of the things she would say is, how many of you have ever felt, and these are generally historians, anthropologists, um, English folks, and she would ask for a show of hands at the beginning of the workshop, how many of you have ever felt misunderstood by a journalist, right? And how many of us would raise our hands? Like everyone, right? You know, 
And then her, Stephanie's response, if you know her, you know what her response was. She said, well, it's, it's your fault. It's your fault you were misunderstood by the journalist. And let me tell you why. She said, we have to make our points much more concise as academics, we're used to the, wa the long wind-up, the abstract, the introduction. And Stephanie taught us that with journalists, you need to get to the point. And so she works carefully with scholars and teaching them kind of how to interact with, with journalists. Um, in Florida, I've been talking a lot with journalists, um, people of the state of Florida. We are coming up on the 100th anniversary of the 1920 Florida election, which is the bloodiest election in 20th century U.S. history. And there's a lot of commemorations happening. There is a reparations bill, which is pending, which will be pending in the Florida State Legislature this coming um, legislative session for the, um, the descendants of the survivors and victims of the Ocoee Election Day massacre uh, in Orange County in 1920. Um, there's a lot of work that we're doing in trying to repair historical damage and uh, in, in terms of racial truth and reconciliation uh, projects all across the South and really all across the country. So um, the, the interactions I've had with journalists have generally been pretty, um, pretty, pretty positive. But again, I was trained to, to be as concise as possible to avoid the windup to, you know, it's nice to talk about complexity. Every issue is complex, but don't allow that to get in the way of giving a clear uh, explanation. If you can, if you can't, you know, as we were saying earlier, you know, then, then take a pass. Um, but, but some of the disconnect between um, scholars and journalists, I think um, is, is on us. I mean, at least that's how I was trained. Uh, so I was not trained, and I'm not at all concise. Um, my experience with journalists has generally been pretty good, um, and but varied, right? And there's a lot of there's a lot of ways things can go sideways between an interview and an article. Um, you know, you mentioned you mentioned headlines before, right? The people writing the story don't write the headlines either. I mean, that's. That's the, the, the issue, and this is a, a real issue on, I mean, I, I hate to sort of have this conversation keep coming back to social media, but it really is a real problem on social media, which is that headlines are designed for clickbait. People respond to the headline and don't read the article, um, and often the headlines are terrible, right? I mean, how many times do we need to see a headline that tells us that something is happening that is the untold story of something, and all of us are like, really? Because I've got six books behind me that tell that story, right? Well, the people writing the article don't write that. Um, somebody in an editorial office somewhere or, I don't know, maybe a robot writes the headlines. Just think that they have robots now that are writing news stories, right, for the AP. Um, but, you know, journalists, I find it, it depends a lot. I think that the real – one thing that, that concision doesn't always solve – is that you can do an interview with a journalist for 20 minutes or half an hour, make your points as concisely as possible. They use two lines from your 20 minutes. And you can't control which two lines they use no matter how concisely you set them. I mean, your best lines get left on the cutting room floor, except when we write, we cut them ourselves, right? <laughs> we get to decide which ones are the good ones. Um, and so I don't... I don't think journalists, you know, we can critique journalists, I think, pretty easily, right? But I don't think that journalists, the ones that I generally have dealt with, don't approach these stories and come to us for our expertise because they're trying to get it wrong, right? They're trying to miscommunicate what we're saying to the public. Um, I think there are, there are some weird issues there about um, – uh, how you sort of say where you got a piece of information that's different for us than it is for them. Uh, issues of citation that I know enrage people all the time, right? That they don't make reference to historians that they've gotten information from. They've got they, – they've, they've looked at people's books and don't cite them. Um, and sometimes that's a, that's a real thing. That's real ground for criticism there. You could have done this and you chose not to. Um, but I do think that a lot of the, the things that go wrong between – 
historians and journalists. Um, I don't usually think it's malicious. Um, and I think that there are a lot of there are a lot of things that happen in sort of the stages of production of an article. And I think that there are a lot of just sort of differences of standards between the way academics work and the way journalists work that I, and I don't know what the solution to that is. I think we could I, – I don't know that there's any forum where journalists and academics can get together and talk to each other about how they create their work, right? Not anything about the specifics of a particular story, but how do you construct what it is that you do? Because I think there's – I don't pretend to understand how journalists work, but I understand it enough to know it's not the way we work. Um, and I wonder if maybe things would get better in terms of the way history is presented in the headlines if there were ways for journalists and historians to sort of talk to each other and understand what exactly is going on in that communication process. Well, you can put that together that's if you right. want. No, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I totally agree, Josh. I mean, I think that that's a really important point about the kinds of the the kinds of structures and pressures that journalists have that we do not have. They are, you know, because whenever we get media requests, inevitably there is the if you could call me back today, that would be great. My deadline's in four hours. My deadline's in four <laughs> hours, right? And that's not the way we work. We're like, I'm going to stew about this for seventeen months, <laughs> and then maybe I'll write a sentence and then I'll delete it, right? Like, there's not, journalists are super fast writers, and that's another thing to know about, you know, if you want to engage in, in this kind of um, public writing, you have to be willing to do it like that. You have to be willing to do it fast, you have to be willing to sit down and have it not maybe be the best prose you've ever written, because you've written it in a day. But, um, so they have to work very quickly, and so if you don't get back to them, you know, you can't really criticize them for not using your work, right? Like, um, and uh, they also, as you're pointing out, I mean, I think editorially, like you may give them all this like amazing interview and everything, and then it just ends up, they, they don't even use it because either they have put it down to one or two sentences, but then the editor cuts it. Or, you know, I mean, this is the, this is the format. And it's not, I think now with online stuff, um, it might be a little bit different. They have a little more wiggle room, I think, um, journalists in terms of length and things. So they're not trying to fit it into a, you know, a specific kind of print column. Um, but I do think that tradition is still there. They're trying to streamline as much as possible. And so you end up on the cutting room floor and you're like, well, I did all this work and I'm not, you're, you know, I've clearly informed the article, but you haven't name checked me. You haven't linked to my book. Like, what are you doing? Um, but a lot of that has to do with, from their side, how the work is actually produced and processed and published. So, and, and I would just say, I've noticed lately, there is a tendency among historians to uh, assume that if a journalist is writing about your field, um, that they should have gotten in touch with you. Or perhaps they did read your work and they used elements from your work and didn't attribute it to you. Um, and this has sparked recently some very public accusations of plagiarism um, against journalists, which have not been proven. And so I would just say, like, <laughs> if take a step back, if you really do believe that a journalist has taken your work, that, you know, if you've either written in an article or a book or in another context, and has lifted that material as their own, then contact the journalist directly um, and discuss it with them kind of privately. Um, don't take it directly um, to, a, to a forum like Twitter um, because bad things will happen in the wake of that. Um, so to, to think about interfacing with uh, journalists or even just uh, just journalistic forums um, a little bit differently. I've, I've been interviewed by journalists and had that experience of having my interview cut down to one quick soundbite. Um, but I've also interfaced with my university's uh, press office um, when they need something, uh, for example, about 1619 quickly. Um, and uh, 
in that case, I actually was emailed a set of questions to respond to. And so I had a lot more control over what went into the final piece. Um, but reading the questions, I could very quickly tell that, A, the person who was asking them did not know much about the history of slavery in the U.S. And B, was not fully convinced that slavery was such a big deal for Kentucky, um, which is astounding, but is was true of the line of questioning. Um, and so, and then also asked if I would uh, revise and review the questions, um, to which my response was, well, that's not actually my job. I'll just answer what it is you asked and we'll see where we get. Um, and so sometimes we do get the opportunity to kind of see where somebody's going with this. Um, and it's important to pay attention to that uh, and to craft what we say um, in line with where we think they're going with this line of questioning. On the other hand, I've also had the opportunity to write uh, an op-ed. Um, Ed Baptist and I wrote one together uh, in in hopes of great in a in hopes of publicizing the Freedom on the Move project that Josh is also a part of. Um, he also wrote an op-ed um, in conjunction with uh, the release of our online project, um, and we interface with editors at the Washington Post who were eager to get the story of the project out there, um, did seem excited about the project, um, but ultimately wanted to edit the piece in such a way that, I mean, to make a long story shorter, uh, <laughs> would sort of... Uh, everybody's a little bit racist, our story about the connections between uh, policing enslaved people through uh, runaway notices and contemporary confrontations with um, overwhelmingly white Americans and African Americans that lead to police violence um, or just vigilantism in general. Uh, and neither of us were on board with that interpretation that, you know, it's really all Americans that are making these phone calls about black people selling lemonade or being at a local pool. Um, we, we were not going to put our names on a piece that claimed that. Um, and so going back and forth with the editor and then the editor's boss and then multiple press offices was really eye-opening that even in an op-ed setting where they seem to be very excited about the two of us writing something and relying on our expertise, um, that they had a particular politics about the way that they wanted our, us to present our own story. Um, and luckily, um, Ed, uh, Ed took the brunt of the attack and um, was very stalwart in pushing forward that we were not going to compromise uh, the, the thrust of our op-ed. Um, but this is something else that also happens in these sorts of forums, that it's not just Twitter trolls who push back against our expertise. It's not just, um, you know, it's not just the kind of stereotypical bot or person who's only there to troll, um, that we will also get pushback um, from folks who do, quite frankly, know much less about what we're talking about than what we do. Um, and so being prepared to then forcefully stand up um, for that is also super important. Um, and also be being willing to pull the piece and walk away if that's what it takes, um, because that's, that's also important. Um, thanks, everyone. I think what I want to do now is like pivot to allow audience questions. Please. Um, as you can see, that there's, you know, this is an, actually, I think it's an exciting time for historians. There's a lot to navigate. So um, let's, I'd like, we'd like to hear from you and in, in your questions. So I'll jump in once. It's always a delay. Yes, sir. One of your comments uh, where somebody was responding back to some of uh, your responses on things like Twitter was like, oh, real people believe this or that or other, other things like, sort of um, respond to this sort of idea like there's this divide between academics and the rest of society. Hmm. Should we repeat the question? Okay, okay, so the question was, you know, the hard um, question. you get, you know, there's criticism, you know, that, that we're not real people, I guess, you know, and what is, 
you know, and so how do we address things where you know they didn't, you know, academics against everybody else? How are, how are we responding to that? I mean, I think that's the danger of being wholly reactive in this and wholly kind of fact-based corrective in this, because it does give it does give a sense like, um, oh, you people said this. Actually, you're wrong. It happened this way. Da 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 da, and that can create that sense of divide. Um, and so, one of the ways I think to address that is to be more proactive. So if, if there are events coming up, if there are anniversaries, if there are things happening, I mean, we know, we know you know, I think um, Karen had mentioned before, elections, uh, we know what's coming, <laughs> right? Um, coming to uh, yes. Um, and so if you've got something to say about um, these particular events or, or what has happened in the past with that kind of context, put something out there proactively so that you can say, you know, this is, as, as a kind of helpful guide um, to uh, future events, instead of always just being reactive and always be, you know, feeling like you are the corrective or kind of calling someone out on things. So that's one possible way, um, because I do agree, like it does create this sense, um, especially, you know, with interactions like with Kevin Cruz and Dinesh D'Souza, this idea that like, one person keeps saying all these things and the other person keeps saying, you're an idiot. Like, no, that's not the way. And then who are you really talking to? Who are the constituencies really involved? Are you really making a difference in that sense? Or is it just creating this divide that academics are, you know, assholes basically, <laughs> like, and are just trying to lord over everyone, like our knowledge? Yeah, I think one of the most positive spaces that I've seen, um, uh, various publics interact with academics uh, was around the television program Underground that ran mm. far too shortly um, on network television. And a number of historians of slavery would tweet along with episodes as they were happening, not to instantaneously fact check, um, but to also highlight other resources and other work that spoke about whatever theme the episode happened to be landing on. And that happened relatively organically. I think that there are some folks who were on board specifically to do social media outreach. I, I, I don't know the timeline on that. Um, but there was a way in which uh, various publics had all this access to professional historians, and there were really wonderful generative threads coming out of... Um, the program, I mean, the program itself, as a historian of slavery, I knew what sources they had looked at just by watching the episode. I didn't have any inside information, but I, I knew what WPA narrative they had read to construct that narrative. Um, and it was actually really fun to then point people to, you know, you do have access to this and it's free and it's online. And, you know, many of you who don't follow any historians on Twitter, because why would you, uh, are now being introduced to some and are following all this work that for various reasons throughout your education, you've been told was impossible. Um, so I also think, you know, we focused a lot on the reactive pieces uh, to what we do on social media, but overwhelmingly my work on social media is about making sure that communities who have much less access to what it is that we do um, have a space to gain more access to what it is we do um, uh, and are connecting with the idea that you could then connect with someone who is an expert and what you're most interested in um, is is one piece that is sort of positive about the space. Um, and so in a forum like that, I've actually seen much less of a um, – you know, oh, those tyrannous blue badges are coming to to kill our party. Um, but more of a, this is so cool that I'm, I can watch this conversation happen between, I don't know, Dinah Barry and Erica Dunbar and Jessica Johnson, and um, and it's happening in real time. And I'm never going to be in a space where I can afford to take a day off work to go to a symposium where all three of them are there. But from my couch watching an episode of Underground, I get to watch their expertise in real time. Um, so I do think it's careful to be clear that um, there are a number of really positive things that come out of this level of access. Well, one thing I would say, though, is that the, the, in some ways the question – the answer to the question is, well, how do you deal with people who are responding to you not in good faith? 
Mm-hmm. And that's the answer, right? I, and I don't know what your particular answer is, but I think a lot of times when people are responding, you know, they've, they've discovered somewhere in an online logic class that an argument from authority is not an effective argument, right? But they, they conflate the idea that you're saying, I have a PhD, therefore I know things, with the idea that I have a PhD and that means I have some expertise on this. Right. And so when they're they're coming at you from you're trying to talk down to me because you're an authority and you have a fancy degree. And that's usually not the point at all. And in fact, I think they know that's not the point. Right. What they're trying to do is undermine the fact that you have specific knowledge about this topic. Right. And I do think that 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 critique is part of a kind of a larger attack on the very idea of expertise as a thing. And so I think the answer to the question in some ways is, well, how do you deal with people who are not dealing with you in good faith? Um, Because I think they often are not. Um, They're not really interested in engaging with you about the merits of what the particular argument is. They just want to say, well, you're being a fancy pants. And so I know better than you because I read a Wikipedia article. Right. And I look and I think that that there are ways there are ways to do it that are extremely condescending from an academic's perspective. Right. There are certain we've all seen academics talk down to people. Um, We've all probably been guilty of that at some point or another on purpose or not. Um, But I also do think there's a point where you have to be willing to say, I know more than than you about this. And I'm not saying that to be rude. I'm not saying it to be condescending. I'm saying because it's true. And you just don't know what you're talking about. And if that comes across as, well, you're not a, you know, real people think differently, well, then at some point you just throw your hands up and walk away. Um, Because I I don't, I don't think that's an argument that, that can be, it's not an argument that's being engaged on the same terms. And that's not always true, obviously, but. I want to add just to, I really enjoy when we're not historians 24-7. You know, when we show other sides of our personality, um, when Kevin Gannon tweets out pictures of his dog, Yoshi and Lulu, who are now as famous as he is, um, when he started doing that, and I think that that makes him somewhat makes him more human and real. It's like if I put out a picture, you know, post a picture of my new pit rescue or something like that, um, or I just say something silly or something like that. It's just to say, show that you're not, you know, that's not who you are 24-7. You're, you're more than a historian, but, and in some ways maybe that helps to, to bridge this gap that we're, we're not real somehow. I don't know. Let's take another question. Uh, yeah, you, she had, she had raised hers and then I'll come to you. Okay. I, I haven't. Um, I haven't. I know, I know I'm familiar with with that, and I think it's particularly useful for for women um, and uh, scholars of color, female scholars of color, all of that. You know, I think we all. You know, that that's where they because the vast majority of op eds are written by white men, and so there's you know the and then it's like let's say ninety five percent and five the rest of it, the other five percent is everybody else. Um, so we sh- I think it'd be good if we, we were able to do that. I just kind of learned on my own, uh, just through the process of doing it. And what I try to do, at least um, for my colleagues, is make the offer um, to assist my junior colleagues and say, okay, you want to do this? Let me, let me help you out. Let me show you at least what I've learned. I don't know about the rest yeah. of you. I don't recall doing an op-ed workshop per se. I mean, I was writing op-eds for McClatchy and they would have uh, news services and, you know, they would have guidelines. Um, but I try to make, uh, to actually do workshops with my students, uh, especially grad and undergrad students, 
the, there is a discipline to writing a 750 word op-ed. Um, it takes practice. It's, it's not like riding a bike where you learn how to, how to write and then you automatically can, can do it. Um, but once you learn how to do it, I mean, I, you know, we just lost one of our uh, dear colleagues, uh, David Colburn, a uh, great historian of, of African-American history, uh, one of the, the co-authors of the Rosewood uh, report, uh, which led to uh, uh, compensation for the survivors or the descendants of the victims of Rosewood. And David was constantly writing op I can never forget, you know, just like these other scholars, I mean, how did they have all this time to write these? But with David, it was a discipline he learned over the years. You know, the, the practice of that 750-word op-ed. My grad, it's interesting. Um, I have some current and former grad students in the audience, so I don't want to um, say anything that's going to offend anyone. My undergrads sometimes have an easier time with the discipline of the op-ed because... I'm not sure we're training grad students how to write well in grad school now. That's another discussion. Um, because again, with op-ed, you can't, you don't have the wind up. You don't have, you just can't, you know, kind of circle, circle your way back to the main point. You have to start with the main point. But once you really learn how to do that, keep doing it um, as much as you can. Again, it's not like riding a bike. Uh, if you stop writing op-eds and you try to write one two, three years later, it's almost like you have to learn how to, how to do them again, but they're very important. And again, you know, what has neoliberalism not impacted? Okay. So one of the grave impacts of neoliberalism has been the decline of the, you were talking, we've kind of been elliptically discussing this. It's been the decline of the expert journalist who really knows a lot about certain fields like civil rights, like labor, like politics, so on and so forth. And so that has opened up another space for us to write these op-eds. Now, this is free labor, right? And, and they know they're getting this from us. But example, uh, my uh, local newspaper, um, which up to recently was owned by the New York Times, I don't know who owns it now, the Gainesville Sun, on Sundays, half of the paper is op-eds, right? And so scholars from different disciplines and, and different people write these op-eds. So there, there's spaces that have opened up for us. Uh, but again, we have to just kind of practice on how, how to do this. Yeah. Um, how can you give us some guidance on learning how to read national events so that if we see something that relates to our work, work we'll be able to sit down over a weekend and or whatever over a forty-eight hour period and write an op-ed piece and then get it to, and then turn it in uh, to wherever uh, so that uh, so that our voices are. are like what's your, what's your advice for that? Well, one thing I'd say is that um, I think people who haven't done it very much don't they don't like they don't know where to start. Um, and I think the place to start is um, pitch it. You know, if you see something and it relates to your work, or or you have an idea and you're like, I think I can do this. Um, it, Get in, find out who you need to contact at whatever it can be a newspaper. I mean, it, one thing that that's the dirty little secret of all this is that the the appetite for content is bottomless, right? There are so many venues out there that need content, and yes, it's often unpaid labor. Your your payment is the exposure for yourself most of the time. Sometimes you'll find places they'll pay you a few hundred dollars, but I mean, I think even the Times only pays yeah. you a few hundred dollars, right? They're, they're, this is not a way to to freelance your way out of academia, right? Um, but I but I, but at the same time, you, I don't think you need to feel obligated to sit down and like, okay, I really need to write this out and get it right before I ask somebody, are you interested, yeah. right? Um, I think getting out ahead of it. And say, but 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 if they say they like it, you got to be ready to go. So there's that. Um, yeah. But I, but I, I what all I'm saying is like I don't think you need to fully frame the the piece. Once you've got the idea, see if there are people interested. And and once somebody bites, you have to be ready to, to jump on it. Yeah. Yeah. And the so one of the ways to think about it is if you're so one of my friends had had written an article at one point about the the history of the EPA, and you know there was a moment about two years ago when they were trying to destroy um, the EPA. And so um, the, the angle there 
was that this was actually created by Republicans, <laughs> this agency. <laughs> um, so it's not, it's not just about, oh, we're going to have an impeachment. I know a lot about the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. I'll pitch an op-ed. There has to be an angle, right? So what, what is the best way to think about it, and this is how you pitch it, is what is the takeaway? So what is the person, what is the one sentence takeaway going to be? And weirdly, often in op-eds, that's your first sentence. Of, <laughs> I mean, and again, this is like not the way we think as academics. We're like, no, wait, what? <laughs> um, but to think about it just in those terms, and, it, and it, so it needs to be a spin on it, sort of like <laughs> the untold story. <laughs> um, like what, what is going to be the thing that's going to surprise the reader about you know, your specific take um, on this event that's currently happening in its historical context. Um, and if you're uncomfortable, you find that you're uncomfortable with the op-ed format, you know, you get like 700 words and you need a fast take. Um, there are other venues for publication that may make more sense where you get closer to 1,500 words, 1,000 to 1,500. Um, and you do get to write like a historian, but for a popular audience. Um, Black Perspectives publishes really excellent historical work um, in short format, um, and they accept pitches. There are a number of other historical blogs. Um, you know, look for a, a blog with an editorial board. Look for a blog um, that's published scholars you respect. Um, some are a little bit more homemade than others, um, but they're all really great venues uh, for publication uh, to get especially takes about current events that relate to history out there. Um, Process History, the OAH blog, is another really good uh, historical blog that publishes really great reviews, publishes great, um, and often reviews of, like, contemporary media. Um, so it's not just the op-ed in, you know, the Washington Post that you have to immediately jump into to get some practice in shorter form writing. Um, the blogosphere is also a really great place to go. Um, reaching out to your friend with that podcast is another great place to go uh, because those can give you kind of get your feet wet, get you thinking about talking to public audiences. Um, one thing I'll toss out there because, of course, Paul, you mentioned this and we've mentioned this a couple different times, um, is that often this work, is, it's unpaid and it's also not always incentivized. Um, so particularly for those of you who are junior scholars mm -hmm. like myself, really be clear, um, especially wherever you are and whatever point you are in your career, um, the ways you engage in this kind of labor. Um, and I know a number of departments and institutions are moving towards more expansive uh, tenure and promotion models, um, but it's also really important to think about um, your time commitment. Uh, to various kinds of scholarship. There's a huge, like I said earlier, I've met a number of graduate students who feel all this pressure to be public intellectuals um, and don't necessarily know or understand, you know, some of the most vocal voices are already full professors. They have multiple books that, that the ways that they're engaging in social media um, are facilitated by the fact that they have these full careers. Um, and so it's important to to be very uh, careful with uh, your time, um, especially if you're dealing with the ever ticking tenure clock, because sure, that op-ed in the Times is gonna look super cool in your packet, um, but that is almost always not the thing that departments are looking for. Um, I believe that should change, but it has not changed universally yet. So that's also something really important to consider. And for senior scholars, consider pulling in, you know, junior junior members of your departments on these projects to kind of support the ways that they're being introduced to this kind of scholarship um, so that the burden of time um, maybe falls a little more heavily on you, but they're also getting their name out there in different ways. There are ways for this to be about mentoring too in the profession. Yeah, and also I would just add that one of, so one of the barriers to sort of doing the op-ed might be that you're, you know, you don't really know how to go about writing it or pitching it. The other can be just pure access. Like, who do you actually send the email to, right? Um, because lots of newspapers, you know, some some will say, will give a, an actual email address. Um, some will have a more general submission site. Um, but 
one of, so this is where you use your other forms of contacts and your networking. And you can just, if you're on Twitter, you go on Twitter and say, hey, Twitter historians, I'm thinking of an op-ed. Does anyone have the contact for, so, you know, for this particular paper? Please DM me, right? And then you get the contact, and then you're able to say, this person who's written for you before suggested that I write to you with this idea I have for an op-ed. That gets a look, right? Instead of just being a person, you know, trying to put it into some <laughs> anonymous hopper, hopper, yeah, where you don't know where it goes and you don't know. I mean, the great thing about this, which is, again, totally unlike academia, you will know within like 48 hours. Like if the person actually receives your pitch, like you'll know they'll either say to you, they'll either say to you, thanks for this, we'll respond if we're interested. And then if you don't hear, you're like, okay, they're not interested and you can take it somewhere else or you can abandon it and do your other things or do whatever. Um, but they will actually get back to you quickly, which feels like a miracle sometimes <laughs> instead of like, I'm waiting for eight months um, for my peer review. Um, so that is a, um, but the access is really important. Like, cause sometimes you have no idea who are you going to pitch this to, right? So, so use all of your contacts. Like, no, like if you know that like, you know, all of us up here have written, you know, for, for in those outlets. So who did we actually talk to? We're happy to share that information with you. So go and get it. Yeah, one thing also that's different about the way the academy works is that you can pitch it to more than one place at a time, right? Because yeah. if a journalist emails you and they're like, my deadline's in four hours, they ain't going to wait for you. So you don't have to wait for them. This is, this is on their turf and their grounds. And if you pitch it, I mean, you may have a specific place you want, and that's different. But if you're just like, I just want to place this somewhere, this is an event that's moving fast, you can pitch it to more than one. And that's, that's okay. And if they come back to you and say, we really want this, if you got it picked up by someplace else first, well, that's it, you know? And if that, that happens. Mm -hmm. Shannon, you want to Yeah, I want you alluded to this, and I want um, to make sure that we address this, this uh, stealing ourselves from the backlash. So every time my local paper, which is the largest in the area, you know, he emails me and says, can you write not like the op-ed? I have to prepare myself for the fact that I'm going to get the backlash. Um, and so I know that you've experienced nice. some of this, so much so that I don't allow my photograph. Yeah, there's a definitely, um, I, don't, I haven't actually been trolled on Twitter, but I have received a lot of email, um, you know, and there was one uh, last year when I was on CNN, I was commenting on the Cindy Highsmith, um, you know, had gone to a Senate Academy, and she had to get you a know, better cap on and everything, she's running for Senate, and I, and I got this like really weird email and then the guy kept emailing and he kept emailing it wasn't like i don't ever respond to these things that's the first thing don't respond whether they're nice or not unless you know them um to to that and um this is a, a something that you need to know as academics that your university may not always protect you um and so uh when, by the third email um which included all sorts of derogatory comments and, and things I got a little nervous about that because I've never, you know, I've gotten nasty emails, but one that kept sending and sending. And so I, um, I, thought, I didn't even know, like, where was I going to go first? First I went to the university attorney. She says, well, you know, we can't help you. Then I go, and she says, go to campus police. I go, and I also called, I've uh, gotten in contact with IT. IT said they couldn't do anything about it. Then I go to the campus police, and the campus police says, um, that doesn't rise to the level of a threat. I felt threatened. I said, what do you, so what do you do? So you, it's like, it is and it isn't like domestic violence in that when, what are you going to do, wait until somebody comes on campus and hurts somebody? Is that when it's a legit threat? You know, and, um, and then it turned into, you know, um, it was kind of an interesting discussion. I just participated in our university's like legal symposium on this and this issue. I don't know that I'm going to get protected, but this is the things you need to know about your university. It's like if you write something that sort of 
controversial and you certainly get threatening messages and phone calls, um, which I've gotten to. So uh, it's like, you know, what's your, where's your university's stance on that? Are they going to back you up and offer you protection? I don't know that they will. Um, I'm just being honest with you. Um, I mean, they'd have to be like on campus coming, you know, coming to your office or in your class or something like that. Um, but I think it's good to check on. I mean, I won't tell anybody else's story, but I'll just say that I, I know a number of um, black women academics who have had things rise to physical threats and people milling around the parking garage and, um, you know, actual very visible direct threats uh, to their safety and well-being. Um, and different universities have responded differently to those situations. Um, I think it's important, um, protect, particularly if you're pre-tenure, to get a really good idea of what protection does and doesn't exist at your university. Um, and then to be very clear that if you are in a public forum, um, so like, you know, tweeting something is like running into a stadium full of strangers and screaming, whatever it is you're saying out loud. And sometimes absolutely no one turns around and it's crickets. And sometimes everybody turns around and you don't ever really know which time that's gonna be the thing that happens. Um, so, or which thing is gonna catch on. Um, and so just being aware that that's really what you're doing um, and being aware um, like you said, stealing yourself for the backlash, stealing yourself for people's responses um, is super important. Um, I will tell a piece of my own story. I was in a documentary uh, with Skip Gates, and after my face appeared on national television on PBS, I started getting just weird emails, um, almost all of which I forwarded to my chair on my official uh, you know, university uh, email account so that there was a consistent record of what had happened. Um, and particularly ones that, uh, were, it could be fall into the category of sexual harassment. Um, I made sure to forward so that I had, a, a record of what was going on. Um, only as a way to create a clear timeline. Um, so the, you know, the, the rule of thumb of not, Responding is a really good one, um, but one thing you can do is keep very, very good records and make sure that there are subpoenaable <laughs> records that follow a clear pattern that you told someone. Um, I happen to have a chair that was up for getting all that all the time, um, but that's another thing to think about. Um, it didn't directly stop the emails, but it also made sure that someone somewhere had records of what was going on. who should be in contact with each other when you're getting, you know, harassing emails weren't in communication with one another. And there needs to be some more of a coordinated effort um, on campuses. Yeah, I mean, I w 
I would just um, echo everything that's been said earlier about uh, documenting uh, cases if you receive threats, uh, to document those, to give those to your chair, to make sure your administration uh, is dealing with those. I mean, sadly, I mean, some of the, the most aggressive emails I have received, and uh, I've received uh, physical threats, but um, actually some of the, the most aggressive have been actually from uh, colleagues um, when I've spoken up about guns on campus. I mean, right now that's a big issue in Florida. We have a lot of people who want us to have our students having guns on campus. And um, some of the people that do want us to have uh, guns on campus are our faculty, believe it or not. Um, and so we have to be prepared for those types of, of attacks as well. And um, again, I'll just make a pitch for unionization. The, the gem of our collective bargaining contract at the University of Florida is Article 10. That's our academic freedom of speech article. And the reason we have that is that for generations on my campus, faculty were fired for things like uh, criticizing Robert E. Lee, uh, criticizing secession of the South. Uh, Florida has this weird thing about an elite which wants to be more Southern than, than other Southern states, right? Um, we had the Johns Commission. I mean, there's a reason why we talk in code sometimes. And we say that, well, you can't really say anything meaningful until you get tenure. I mean, no one in this room would say such a thing, right? But we do have a lot of colleagues who tell us to be so cautious that if you wait until you get tenure to start speaking <coughs> uh, assertively, it's too late by then. You'll never be able to adopt that kind of practice of really saying what you mean and mean what, meaning what you say. And so we need to find other types of protections. Collective bargaining is one of them. But also, again, within this room, I know there's a lot of supportive networks, professional associations. We need to be there for, for each other. You know, when, when a colleague says something, you know, we can also be proactive when, when we see a colleague saying something where they have to be in the news, where they have to be in the public eye. Let's be there for, for each other and, and really try to have each other's backs as much as possible and not look at this as just kind of an individual, oh, well, I'm glad I didn't say that. But that's true. But I'm glad I didn't say that. You know, right? Let's let's not let's get out of that habit. Um, yeah, I think all of this is really great advice, especially since probably the vast majority of the people here have academic affiliations. But speaking as someone who does not, um, I have no protection from any larger institution um, in, to track uh, any of this for me. So uh, I have my local police force which, you know, is often called out to <laughs> similar kinds of things. I received just a <laughs> terrible email um, because I live in a very small town in Massachusetts. So the police blotter often includes these kinds of things. But so I could call them if, if need be. Um, but otherwise, I just have record keeping. Um, and I also have the benefit of, of uh, being married to a lawyer for 20 years. Um, so I have absorbed a lot of his legal language um, and can issue a cease and desist uh, just by email if necessary. Um, so, but it's, I mean, it's important to think about, especially if, uh, if you are affiliated with an institution that you think is not gonna back you, what other options do you have at your disposal? Um, and it is good to kind of think these things through if you really think that this is going to create um, some problems for you and some backlash that could cross the line into actual physical um, threats and people kind of tracking you down personally. And it is important to know that this is, you know, this is part of it and it is a terrible part of it. But yes, know that there is a community, you have a community of people who are doing this, um, who can help you and who, who can help galvanize um, and and get you help uh, if, if you should need it. But also, you know, don't let that fear stop you from saying the things that you that you really feel need to be said. I can, um, I'm sensing people fading in the audience. <laughs> so, um, and we've, we've been at it for an hour and a half. I, I, what I would do is encourage you to, um, if you have questions, you want to come and talk to either of us, um, do that. And I will say if you have any questions, those of you who are interested in, in doing these types of things, um, feel free to email me. At, uh, my university email, kcox at uncc.edu. I'm 
I'm on Twitter, Sassy Craw. <laughs> Vanessa's on Twitter. Maggie's on Twitter. Josh is on Twitter. Paul, I don't think you're on Twitter. Uh, I don't have time to be on Twitter. I wish uh, I did. He's doing the AC. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, okay. I'll take that. It worked that way. So thank you all for being with us for this, uh, this panel. Thank you. Thank you.